I'm Barbara Bynum, and um, it's my pleasure to welcome you to the forum this morning. Um, again, it's so good to be back and meeting in person. Um, just a quick reminder that because of the construction, because CMU is redoing the bathrooms up front, we're coming in the side door these days, and there are other bathrooms that are even in worse shape than those were, but there are bathrooms, and if you go out this hallway and down that way, um, you'll find them there. And if you want to peek, they are, um, these bathrooms are under construction, and I'm hoping they'll be really nice when we finish. Um, but thanks to CMU, and thanks, Steve, for letting us um, continue to use this facility. This is fantastic, and we're able to accommodate so many more people. Jason reminded me that he hasn't been here for a while, and um, was still in his head kind of picturing um, Heidi's, the deli. <laughs> and we've grown so much since we were meeting the deli and half of you were in a booth facing the wrong way and twisting your head around. And um, it's so great to see the forum continue to be a good source of information for our community. So I'm super excited to welcome my friend Jason Olin this morning. Um, Jason has been with the State Division of Water Resources since 2010. He was um, a division, division leader and worked out of the Montrose office until this past June when he was promoted to deputy state engineer. So he's one of the top state engineers for Colorado and that and that means in charge of water. That's state engineer, that's water. You don't do like bridges and stuff like that and roads. It's it's water. Um, and he is based here in Montreux. So one of the cool things of COVID and working from home is they they decided they could definitely promote someone who could work remote and then drive to Denver a lot. Um, before working for the state, uh, Jason was the city of Montrose engineer. And before that, he was a, in the private sector doing consulting work on engineering and water projects. He has a civil engineering degree from CSU. And I think his connection to water goes way back. His, um, his relatives, his grandparents, were sugar beet farmers on the Eastern Plains. And so water has always been important to his family. And I thought a lot about that last week during our presentation about the history of Montrose and how important Montrose has always been to this valley. As we all know, Montrose Mon water is on everyone's mind lately. Um, if you drive by Blue Mesa like I did last weekend, you can just see how low it is. And we all have the opportunity to hear a lot about water from different sources. And Jason is here today to talk to us about water from um, the state of Colorado's perspective and what the state is thinking and doing, and I think specifically what's happening at Blue Mesa Reservoir. So let's give Jason a big round of applause. Thank you. Um, like she said, I am the deputy state engineer, but if you have a problem with roads or other things, I probably can't answer those questions. But uh, I can answer your questions about water law in the state of Colorado and how that water law and system is administered. Uh, I work for the Colorado Division of Water Resources. And like uh, Barbara also said, I like to tell people now that I am the first West Slope Deputy State Engineer because those positions have traditionally been based out of Denver. But because of COVID, the one benefit was they realized that we can uh, do work from remote locations, which is a benefit to me because I've been in Montrose for 13 years and, and love it here, so we didn't have to move our family. But um, this is a picture of Crystal Dam. If none of you have been there, this is the lowest reservoir on the Aspinall unit system. Uh, there's Crystal, Morrow Point, and Blue Mesa. And we're going to get to the impacts of drought on these reservoirs in particular at the end, but I'm going to take you on a long journey so that you understand a little bit more about how the Colorado River is administered to get there. So um, first, I like to make sure everybody understands, you know, the, the entity that I work for just a little bit, because most people don't understand how water is administered in the state of Colorado. And I work for the Division of Water Resources. We are a component entity of the Department of Natural Resources, which includes all of these other organizations as well. You'll see that there's two organizations that deal with water. There's Division of Water Resources, which is 
one of the oldest state agencies. Our agency was uh, technically began in 1879 when the water commissioner position was created, and in 1881 when the state engineer position was created, and it became further. The Water Conservation Board was created in the 1930s. Our entity is, for lack of a better term, we administer the priority system in the state of Colorado. We're kind of like the water police. The Water Conservation Board is a policy organization. They deal with more water policy issues. Um, just a, a little bit of a refresher on Colorado and the different river basins that are in Colorado. So this is moving from the Northeast, the South Platte River, Denver sits in here, the Arkansas River, the Rio Grande River, San Juan Basin here actually includes a bunch of tributaries that flow out of the state, including the Dolores, the Animas, and they all combine with the Colorado River out in Utah or New Mexico or Arizona. Uh, the Gunnison River Basin, which is where we sit today, uh, Colorado Main Stem, the Yampa and the White, and then the North Platte is kind of our north slope. It goes north into Wyoming. Our agency wisely then is broken up into those divisions by river basin because water is, doesn't respect county boundaries. I mean, so it makes sense that it would be divided up by river basin. You sit in what we call Division 4, which is the Gunnison River Basin, and the San Miguel and Lower Dolores. We also, met, or I, it's hard for me to get used to saying that I'm with the Deputy State Engineer because I was so long in here in Montrose, but uh, Division 4 where we sit includes the San Miguel and the Lower Dolores. But we have offices. Our agency has offices in Pueblo, Greeley, Steamboat, Glenwood, Montrose, Durango, Alamosa, and Denver. So one office per division, that's set by statute, so that cannot change. <coughs> so, excuse me. our entity's responsibilities are wide and varied, but the main one is water administration. So most of the employees around the state are water commissioners or well commissioners, and they are the ones that make sure that people that are taking water out of our rivers and streams are taking water that they're entitled to take based upon their water court decrees. And I'm not going to get into detail on how you get a water court decree, but the priority system requires you to have a decree for water to take it in a time of shortage when there's not enough water to satisfy everybody. Uh, dam safety is a program where we have dam safety engineers for each division that make sure that the dams that are high hazard that potentially could cause loss of life in the state of Colorado are inspected on a regular basis and that if there's any deficiencies that they get taken care of. We permit groundwater wells. If any of you have a well, um, you may have dealt with our office in getting that well permit. What we're gonna focus on today mostly is this interstate compact. Now the Water Conservation Board actually has a role in dealing with interstate compacts policy-wise, but the D Division of Water Resources is responsible for making sure that we meet our compact obligations to surrounding states. I will make uh, you a little more, I'll educate you a little more on the compact here in a second. We also have a program where we measure stream flows around the state, so if you go to our website, you can see stream flows at various rivers. It's used by recreationalists, uh, people that like to fish. It's also used by agriculturalists that need to know what's in the river, but our water commissioners are the ones that really use that data because if they're going to determine who can take water, they need to know how much water is in the system. And then something that's become a big deal in recent times is this public information. You used to have to go in to our office and go through our paper files and pull out your decree and, or your information on your dam. Now most of that information is available online on our website. You can download uh, all kinds of things that you probably didn't even know existed. So I have our website uh, address at the end of this. And then, as with most jobs, uh, additional program activities as assigned. So if the, the governor or somebody says, you need to do this, well, we get to do that, so. Um, and then just briefly, this is a map of the state that you probably, some of you may have seen before, but it is shows the rivers leaving the state. The width of these lines represents how much water is in each of those rivers in each location. If you look, the Continental Divide is here, so the green is all East Slope, 
or South Slope as the Rio Grande may be called, and the blue is all West Slope, flowing into the Colorado River eventually. If you notice, uh, all of these lines are much larger than the lines in the green areas. That's because about 80% of the water supply in the state of Colorado falls on the west side of the Continental Divide, 20% of it on the east. But we have, these numbers are slightly out of date from 2013 since the census just came out. But suffice it to say the relative percentage is still the same. Approximately 80% of the population lives over here and 20% of the population lives over here, which is what drove these red lines, which represent transbasin diversions. So these are diversions from the Colorado River that go from the west slope to the east slope. These, this number, 345,000 acre feet of water, leaves the Colorado and goes to the Front Range for the Denver to Fort Collins corridor. Uh, 132,000 acre feet leaves the Colorado River Basin and goes to the Arkansas for the Pueblo area and uh, Colorado Springs, and then some tiny amounts go from uh, the Colorado River Basin into the Rio Grande, 1,000 and 2,000 acre feet respectively. So Colorado, we're gonna talk about, mostly about stuff that happens down here to the west of Colorado and the south, but this is where we find ourselves, you know, in that bind on the west slope where we're between big water users downstream in California, Arizona and Nevada, and water users on the east slope. So um, the, there are two general types of, of appropriation systems for water, legal systems that allocate water to people. One of them is the riparian system. <clears throat> riparian law basically means if you live next to the river, if you have a house next to the river, you can take water. You can take water to, to, for crop, you can take water to build something. And so these areas in red and orange all operate on the riparian system because they get more rainfall than we do here. <coughs> Once you cross the 100th meridian, which falls near Lincoln, Nebraska, you get less than 20 inches of rainfall on average per year, which is generally considered to be the amount you need to grow a crop without irrigation. And so when people moved west to these areas here, particularly Colorado, there was a realization that this system doesn't work because if you come and you build a farm and you take a diversion out of the river in 1880 and then your neighbor comes in, moves their family there five years later and diverts the water above you, but you're on a small stream like we have in many places here on the West Slope or East Slope, and they take all of that water, well, that was not you know, considered to be fair and it caused a lot of battles and fights. So Colorado implemented what's called the prior appropriation system. In some circles you'll hear it called the Colorado Doctrine because Colorado was the first state to implement it. And basically the gist of it without getting into the details is if you have an earlier, the earlier right, you're right, the better you're right. So you have a more senior right if your right is earlier. So if you came here and you went to water court and got a decree in 1880, then your right is senior to that person that came in in 1885. And if there's not enough water to satisfy both, the Division of Water Resources is gonna make sure that you get your water first. And that's important when we get into the compact here. So the other thing is that if you look at the map of the United States, Colorado is a headwater state, the main headwater state in the United States. It's water from the Colorado, Arkansas, Platte, and Rio Grande rivers supply some portion of water to all of these states in yellow and Mexico. Um, so it's a big deal. The water that arises here in Colorado is a big deal. It can cause conflict because all these other states want some of that water too, particularly right near where it crosses the border. And 13.7 million acre feet is, originates in Colorado. 60% of it leaves the state and 40% of it is used in Colorado. So more of it actually leaves the state than, than we use here. And part of the reason is because we've had, over the years, we've, we've signed compacts which are essentially treaties with the surrounding states that dictate how much water we can use and how much water we have to send to the surrounding states. And they're written a little bit differently in each case, so each compact, no compact is the same as the other. 
Some of them require a percentage, some of them require a strict amount, some of them have a delivery obligation, but they all are, are intended to create a relationship with the surrounding states that, that means we're not constantly in litigation. So we have nine compacts between the surrounding states. We have three US Supreme Court cases that are involved in those compacts, mostly with Kansas, because Kansas likes to sue the state of Colorado. And uh, so on the Arkansas, uh, the Arkansas has probably been the basin that's generated the most controversy in the past. Um, but we are bound to, when we are making sure that we're meeting our compact obligations, we're also making sure we're meeting obligations that were signed in these Supreme Court cases. And then there's a treaty we have with the Republic of Mexico for the Rio Grande, Tijuana, and Colorado River is a big one. Um, so now we're gonna get to, to what you've all been hearing about. Um, so you have the background. This is, a, this is a, a headline in the New York Times from yesterday, because yesterday, actually, this is timely, the uh, federal government, the US Bureau of Reclamation, declared the first shortage on the Colorado River, and you're gonna find out what that means here in a little bit, but it was in pretty much every national newspaper, USA Today, talking about this in the last few months about the dire situation on the Colorado River. So what I want you to come away from this to understand is what is the system that the Colorado River is managed by <coughs> and what's the impact to our reservoirs, particularly the, the Blue Mesa, Moro Point, and, and Crystal. So who's, who saw, has seen or, has, or saw this, these articles yesterday? Quite a few of you, so you're aware of, of at least generally what's going on. Um, so the Colorado River is a complex system. It's the you know largest river in the Southwest. If you consider the the flow of the Colorado River, it's not very large when compared to the Columbia or the Mississippi or the Missouri, but it is supply water for 40 million people in the West Southwestern United States. It's managed through a complex system of laws that have been written over the years, and they're generally called the law of the river. I know it's not very you know, creative, but um, the first part of that, what's considered the law of the river, if you talk to attorneys, is the 1922 Colorado River Compact. And so why do we sign these com this compact uh, with the surrounding states? So the impetus for using this compact system came in the late uh, 1800s and early 1900s when Colorado got into litigation with the state of Wyoming on the Laramie River, which flows out of the state to the north, and we lost the case with the Supreme Court. So Wyoming was making the case that their use on the Laramie River was prior to Colorado's, and because Colorado operates on the prior appropriation system and Wyoming operates on the prior appropriation system, then it follows along that Wyoming has a senior right to the water to Colorado. That caused a panic in the state of Colorado from the state engineer that was the state engineer at the time and the attorney general's office because they were watching what was happening in Southern California and the development that was occurring and felt like, okay, well, if that same principle is applied across state lines in the Colorado River Basin, we're in big trouble because we don't have the same kind of usage and it's not gonna have, we're not gonna have the same kind of usage for a long time. They could just pretty much develop the whole river and say we have the senior right to it. And so Delph Carpenter, who was the Attorney General at the time in Colorado, decided that we need to come up with a better way to manage water across state lines and that's where uh, this compact idea, which was a treaty between the states came around that compact on the Colorado River was, was one of the first, it was signed in 1922, and it apportioned seven and a half million acre feet to the upper basin, it split the basin into two pieces. It apportioned seven and a half million acre feet of flow to the lower basin each year, and seven and a half million acre feet to the upper basin each year. That's a simplified uh, version of it, but the, the issue, the the issue for the upper basin is that the way it was written is that we are required to deliver seven and a half million acre feet on average at Lee's Ferry here, just below Glen Canyon Dam. There's a reason Glen Canyon Dam sits where it is right now. Uh, so on a 10 year running average, 
10 times seven and a half is 75 million. We have to deliver 75 million acre feet on a 10 year running average to the lower basin states at Lee's Ferry, Arizona, or Lee Ferry, Arizona. And so really, the, we got what, I would, what we would consider maybe a, not as good of a deal as the lower basin because they are guaranteed to get seven and a half million acre feet almost every year. We are guaranteed to get whatever mother nature gives us, right? Or what we can store in our upper basin reservoirs. We don't have a whole lot of control if the flow isn't the amount that they said in the compact, then we kind of bear the brunt of that problem. And that is the problem. The flow in the river is not 16 and a half million acre feet. It's probably closer to 13 and a half million acre feet on an average basis. And unfortunately, when they signed the compact, they were dealing with the most recent hydrology being very wet. So they looked at that very wet hydrology. And if you, I mean, I'll give you a name of a book that you could go read after this that gets into more details. But there was some, some willful ignorance of some data that was around that would say that 16 and a half million acre feet probably was not the right number. But suffice it to say, that's what it was written. But we bear the brunt of essentially that lack of flow in the upper basin. So the upper basin states are Utah, Colorado, Wyoming, and New Mexico. The lower basin states are Arizona, Nevada, and California. And you'll notice California doesn't have a whole lot of area actually within the Colorado River Basin. However, they have the largest, largest apportionment on the Colorado River because of their use for agriculture in the Cacharis and Imperial Valleys mainly. It's also used in the cities of Southern California like Los Angeles but the lion's share of that goes through the All-American Canal to the Imperial Valley where a lot of our winter uh, vegetables are grown. That's where a lot of that comes from. So that's the first part of the law of the river. The second thing that was done that is considered part of the law, law of the river was the 1928 Boulder Canyon Project Act that authorized the construction of Hoover Dam and it also ratified, Congress ratified the compact at that time. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, it apportioned then the water to Arizona, California, Nevada. You'll see California has 4.4 million acre feet, Arizona 2.8, and Nevada has a small portion, 0.38 million acre feet. The next thing, 1944, we signed a treaty with the with the with Mexico and committed one and a half million acre feet to the annual of the annual flow to Mexico. This was considered at the time they thought that this would come out of the surplus that they didn't allocate to the states. But when there's not a surplus, it gets divided half and half between the upper basin and the lower basin. So our obligation to the lower basin, they'll tell you that that actually is not seven and a half million acre feet, it's 8.25 million acre feet because you have to add that 750,000 that is going to Mexico because we've now come to the realization that in most years there's not a surplus. Uh, and in 1948, the upper basin states signed their own compact between each other. You'll notice that in this Boulder Canyon Project Act, they div divided the 7.5 million in the lower basin. This is what divided it in the upper basin. But by 1948, in the 20 years that had passed, we had uh, the Dust Bowl and a big drought that happened. And so the upper basin states wisely decided that, well, we probably don't have 7.5 million so we're gonna apportion it by percentage. Colorado got the largest percentage, 51 and three quarters. Utah uh, got 23% the next amount. Wyoming got 14% and New Mexico got 11 and a quarter. So because they knew that there wasn't seven and a half million and we were kind of supply limited, they did it by percentage, which was probably a good thing. And then the last thing on here is the Colorado River Storage Project Act. That authorized the construction of Glen Canyon Dam. And Glen Canyon Dam is important for us here in the upper basin because like I was showing you, well, it sits right here above Lee Ferry. It's how we can ensure that we can meet our compact obligation to the lower basin states. We can control the flow here and make sure that we deliver 75 million acre feet on a 10 year running average to the lower basin. Without that, it would be, we would be reliant completely on hydrology. And so this was intended to be a insurance policy for the upper basin to prevent a compact call. 
So here's just a picture since I've been doing a lot of maps and, and text of the two reservoirs. Uh, this top one is Glen Canyon. If you've been to Lake Powell, you probably recognize that. Uh, it's actually much lower even than it shows here right now, but you can see the, the definite bathtub ring for the fact that it's drawn down. This is Lake Mead and uh, Hoover Dam, similar. Uh, it's lower right now than this picture currently, but you can still see how low it was even at this time. So now we're gonna to get to what's happened since those compacts were signed. Well, this blue line, I'm an engineer, I like graphs, so sorry. <laughs> it, came, it came to see videos and good pictures. I'm not, I don't have them for you this morning. But uh, this blue line is the supply on a 10-year running average from 1923 when the compact was first signed to 2010. And it doesn't go any further because it doesn't really need to to show you the problem we have here. Supply. Demand. Okay, something happened here that is not good. Demand is exceeding supply, which means that if you exceed, uh, you spend more money in your bank account than you have and than you're making every year, you're eventually going to go bankrupt, right? So right now, you'll see in 2003, approximately, the demand began to exceed supply on a regular basis. This is also when there was some concern that set in that caused states like Nevada and Arizona, cities like Las Vegas and Phoenix to start paying people to remove lawns and stop irrigating you know, lawns that aren't necessary. And that's why you see this demand curve has actually dropped a little bit. It's leveled out of late, but it hasn't continued the same climb because there's been some conservation that's happened recognizing that this demand is now exceeding supply. <coughs> this is my uh, obligatory, this is the problem is the upper basin or the lower basin states mainly, <laughs> but uh, this red line is the use in the up lower basin. You see that it climbed much more steeply. It went well above 9 million acre feet in the late 1990s when there was a surplus. The compact actually allowed them to use one, 1 million more acre feet than they were allotted when there was a surplus. So they weren't doing anything illegal here or contrary to the compact. They dropped down to a little over 8 million acre feet uh, in this recent period in the early 2000s. And then recently with the uh, drought rules that we'll talk about, they've dropped back to 7.5 million acre feet, which is exactly the compact allotment. The upper basin has you know, increased usage, but the the wisdom of Del Carpenter's thoughts about our usage not increasing at the same level is, is witnessed right here. It didn't go up as fast as the lower basin. And we have leveled out at just over 4 million acre feet. So we're using less than our technical compact allotment, but we still are required to send that 75 million on a 10 year running average to the lower basin. And our usage has also dropped in the last few years just because of the drought. So that, this has caused another graph. This is Lake Mead and Lake Powell. If you stack the two on top of each other, how much storage do you have? 50 million acre feet is up here. An acre foot, for those of you that, that aren't aware of, it is how much water would fill an acre to a foot deep. So 50 million acre feet is a lot of water. Um, in the uh, late or early 2000s, 2000 and 2001, we were close to having those both full. Since that time, we've had droughts that have continuously dropped this. So our demand being higher than our supply and the droughts have caused a continuous reduction in the amount stored in these two reservoirs that are the insurance policy for both of our basins. I'm getting close to the end here. So, so this whole situation caused in 2007 the states to say we need to come up with an operating criteria for the reservoirs that we've all said we signed off on because there's constantly <laughs> arguments about how much water is being released from Powell to Mead and how much the lower basin is using so they signed after a lot of discussion and, and um, wrangling a interim guideline for the operation coordinated operation of the two reservoirs that we've been operating on since 07, this expires in 2026. 
So coming close. So this is going to be renegotiated here soon. And it also created tiers of shortages that the lower basin would take if it continued to get worse, which it has. In 2019, after 2018, does anybody remember 2018? 2018 wasn't very good. It was dry. Uh, the last two years haven't been great either, but 2018 was the driest year on the Colorado River, uh, and particularly here on the Western Slope. After 2018, there was a realization that this guideline wasn't enough, that there was additional action needed. So the states got together again and negotiated a drought contingency plan, it includes creating a pool in Lake Powell, an addition, a pool within the current Lake Powell that we as upper basin states can conserve water and call it ours as our own private bank account to prevent a compact call if we conserve water, which would be paying farmers not to irrigate their land for a year and then letting that water flow into Powell and calling it upper basin drought contingency pool. That, whole thing has not been, uh, we, don't have a, we don't have an arrangement on demand management yet. That's something that's being discussed. And then Lower Basin agreed to additional cuts, including California agreed to a cut finally uh, at a certain level in the two reservoirs. And then it was, chipped, it was intended to prevent a compact call, but also to prevent Lake Powell from dropping below critical levels that allow them to create power. Um, and, uh, it was ratified by Congress in 2019, and if you remember 2019, there was a, not a lot of agreement in Congress, there isn't much now either, but it was one of the only things that was ratified almost unanimously by, on a bipartisan basis in 2019. And here, uh, this is a depiction of the Glen Canyon Dam. Here's the power turbines that are generating power. This is the pipeline or penstock that goes to that turbine. It sits at an elevation of 3,490 feet above sea level. Um, so in this drought contingency plan, the decision was made to protect the elevation 3,525, that's 35 feet above where they couldn't make any power at Powell, just to protect that. Because this power generation is a big deal for peak power demand in the Western states, and it generates all the revenue that pays for the Upper Endangered Fish Recovery Program, it pays for operations at these reservoirs. If they can't make that money off the power, it's a problem. And this was the current reservoir storage at the time that this was uh, written. It's actually now 3,555, so it's dropped another four feet. This is your obligatory picture of all the people signing that drought contingency plan and pretending that we all get along. <laughs> um, so what's happened in the last few years that has made it even worse and this is uh, a busy graph but I'm going to try to explain it here and I'm not going to make any you know, big statements on climate change but I'm going to say that if you look at the this is temperatures in the Colorado River Basin this line this dashed red line is the general trend if you do a regression line for the entire period from 1900 to now, it's generally increasing. This is a 10 year running average. So for a while it was kind of fluctuating around a median, but since 1970, it's continuously gone up. This is the river flow in the Colorado River. Same deal, These, this fluctuates every year, right? There's some variability, natural variability in the system. This red dashed line is the average over that whole 1900 period, that's, that's the regression qu equation or line. It's falling over that same period. You see this is the 10 year running average. That hasn't changed as much on flow. But what I wanna point out is this, this period here, 1950s was a drought period. You see that the flow in the river was low. This is, if the average is here, our flow during that period was down below the average. So was precipitation, right? Precipitation was predictably below average. The flow in the river was below average. Here, you see that this recent period flows well below average, but precipitation below average, but not to the same level as here. The problem is that these higher temperatures cause higher evaporation. They cause higher transpiration by the plants, it uses more water, 
and the, th and the soil moisture dries out quicker. And so your runoff is less productive and um, at the risk of, I'm trying to run out of time here. No, you're good. Okay. So this graph here uh, is of all of the years of flow into Lake Powell since it was constructed. You'll see this is back in 1964. You had a really good period here um, in the 80s and uh, 90s. And then since then, since about 2002 is right here, was really low. It's been lower than this black line, this average. This is, uh, so the last two years, 2018, bad. 2020, not so great. This is actually, was produced when they were doing their modeling and was optimistic now that we look at what we actually got. The actual flow, so you look at, this is five million acre feet right here. This is, the green line is what they thought was gonna come in earlier. It was actually right here. It was almost as low or lower than in 2002. And so that's what's caused all of this, all of the articles you see is it's, it's gotten worse much faster than anybody anticipated. People thought, you know, three years ago, four years ago, here's what could happen, but it's probably not gonna happen for 10 years. Oh, wait, it's happening now. Like the, the forecast is that it could, some of these levels, we could reach them next spring. Um, and one of the reasons is and I, you know, the two graphs ago, you saw my, my talk about the temperatures versus the flow. Here is the snowpack above Lake Powell this year. I mean, this is the median. So a 30 year median is the green line. This is what actually occurred. So we peaked out here. If you average all the snow till stations within the basin, 86% of the median. Doesn't sound too bad, does it? 86%, you know, a B, a high B. <laughs> Okay, so this is the modeling they do, and I'm not going to explain all of it, but they do modeling to, to calculate and estimate how much is going to come into all the reservoirs so that those reservoir managers can manage the releases. Back when they start the modeling in January, they have a big wide band because they don't know. You don't know what's going to come in on snowpack for the rest of the year. It gets narrower as you get to the bottom, but as you see, it got worse and worse and worse. This line is your median, 30 year median. We ended up way down here. And so 86% of snowpack, 28.6% of runoff. So the, the, the higher temperatures, the low soil moisture, because we didn't have much monsoon rains the last few years, the production of the basin from a relatively you know innocuous snowpack was terrible. I mean, 28% on an 86% snowpack is not good. If that continues, that's going to be a, a continued problem. Now, we did get some monsoon rains this July. Hopefully it's going to be better and we're going to continue to wet that soil as we go into the winter and our runoff will actually come off uh, in a better fashion next spring, but um, we'll see. So here is a graph fresh out of the yesterday's announcement by the Bureau on their shortage declaration. Um, this is Lake Mead. This is their projections for end of month. So you remember I talked about the, the uh, operating criteria that was written in 2007. They are required in that operating criteria, the Bureau is, to run what they call a 24 month study. It's a, it's a model that predicts what's gonna happen in the next 24 months. So as you get further away from now, which is this, period, this line here designates August or, or the time when they ran the models. Uh, so this is their July modeling. They run it 24 months out. As they get further away from today, they use more average, assume average uh, precipitation. But as you can see here, these are some of those levels in that shortage or the uh, operating criteria and in the drought guidelines. So you probably can't read the number here, but that says 1,050, that's the elevation in Lake Mead, 1,075. This band here is the first shortage tier. And so that's what they declared yesterday was the first shortage because as you can see in, April, in May and June, 
means elevation dropped below that 1,075 level and put us in that shortage tier. This modeling, the green line again, is the most probable. That's what they think is most likely to occur. The red is minimum, that's the likely minimum. And the blue is the likely maximum. Even the maximum doesn't get us out of the shortage criteria in the next 24 months, as you can see. It, it gets us better, it gets us closer in 2023 to getting out, but not much. The most probable continues to decline until we reach the next tier, which is 1,025 to 1,050. And so the most likely scenario means that in 2023, we're gonna be in even further shortage declaration. That's like me, this is like Powell, same graph. This is today. Uh, here is uh, 3,500 minimum power pool. If you remember, I said it was 3,490 feet. That's down here, so it's still a ways below. But that protection level that they wanted to protect is right here at 3,525 that the state signed, not that they, but the state signed that agreement on the drought contingency plan to protect that elevation. If you look at today's level, 35, it's a little below 3550, uh, which is right here. That's projected most probably to go below 3525 by April of next year. And then to recover slightly and then drop and recover. These tiers also dictate how much we have to release to the lower basin. So if we're within this uh, mid elevation release tier, or the lower elevation balancing tier, we are releasing 7.48 million acre feet to the lower basin from Powell to Lake Mead. If we drop below that level, then we would release even less. We'd release 7 million acre feet to the lower basin, which the lower basin doesn't want because that causes me to drop even further, uh, even based upon their shortages. But suffice it to say that, that none of these you know, this maximum scenario looks a little better for Powell than it does for me, but because they're going to continue using the amount that they've been using, the, it's hard to fallow uh, 10 crops of hay or spinach in the Imperial Valley. Um, so this is, and, and I should probably give you a break from all these graphs, but sorry. Um, nobody's looking too glazed over yet, so I hope. Hopefully this is interesting enough to keep you. But uh, this is the uh, table from the drought contingency plan. And here's your tiers. These rows are each tiers of, sh of shortage. So at or below 1,075 at meet and below and above 1,050, that's the first shortage. So in the interim guidelines, they uh, Arizona, this is Arizona and Nevada, Arizona agreed to take a 320,000 acre foot cut that's basically like a third of Blue Mesa Reservoir. They're gonna take that cut. And then in the drought contingency plan, they agreed to take another 192,000 acre foot cut. So their total cut in this shortage is over a half a million acre feet. That's half of Blue Mesa, more than half of Blue Mesa. That's a big deal for, if you're Arizona, the farmers in Pinal County are gonna take a big hit because of that, because they just, they're not gonna be able to irrigate the same amount of fields that they can when they take that big cut. Nevada takes a 21,000 21, acre foot cut, so not as much, but their apportionment under the compact was much less, if you remember. California takes zero. Um, California technically would say they have a per senior right in the system because when, when Arizona wanted to build the project, they call the Central Arizona Project, and if you've been to Phoenix or Tucson, you know you may know what that is, those big canals that come into the cities and provide water to those cities are from the Central Arizona Project. Well, California definitely negotiated with the state of Arizona when they wanted to get that passed through Congress, that their right would be subordinate to California's as long as they could get this Central Arizona Project passed. So they, they don't take cuts until this shortage tier when Mead falls below 1,045 but then they begin to take you know, 200,000 acre feet of cut too. So there is some contribution from the lower basin states to try to mitigate the problem. Uh, from an upper basin perspective, I'd say maybe not as much as we would like, but. 
So that's the tier we're in right now in the blue. And so a total savings of 533,000 acre feet. Those models, mind you, of Lake Mead's levels take this into account though. So it's not like that 500,000 acre feet is going to make a big difference in those models. So now we're finally to where does this put us here in, in the Gunnison River Basin? Because we have one of those three big upper basin projects. We have the Aspinall project here, which was originally called the Kirk County Unit. And uh, Flaming Gorge is the other one. Flaming Gorge is the big bucket. It's got three and a half million acre feet of storage and resides in Utah and Wyoming. Navajo is the third in New Mexico. So what happened yesterday, actually this, this was announced a little earlier than yesterday, sorry, it was at the end of July, was the Bureau was given the ability in the drought contingency plan, if conditions got worse really fast, which as you saw they did, to make an emergency declaration and make emergency releases from the three, from the three upper basin units of the Colorado River Basin Storage Project. That would be Flaming Gorge, Blue Mesa, and Navajo. Uh, the Drought Response Operations Agreement, which is in that drought contingency plan and was agreed to by all of the states, specified that the states would get to sit down and come up with a release plan if it didn't get bad really quickly. Um, the Bureau took it upon themselves to decide that it was getting bad fast enough that they were gonna make a decision to make releases. I'm not gonna get into whether we agree that that should have happened yet, particularly from the Aspinall unit where the levels are really low already. Flaming Gorge is mostly full right now. It was at over 80% full. Um, but they did, and this is what they announced in late July, was that they were gonna release 181,000 acre feet from the three units. And the way they calculated that was they decided that they needed three feet. They wanted the level in Powell to not drop by three extra feet. It's not gonna go up by three feet. It's just not gonna drop three more feet. So that three feet amounts to 181,000 acre feet. And then they apportioned that to those three reservoirs. The biggest lump or sum is coming out of Flaming Gorge, 125,000 acre feet. The next, is com the next biggest amount, 36,000 acre feet, is coming out of Blue Mesa, and 20 is coming out of Navajo. And so what does that do to the levels of Blue Mesa? Well, the end of year storage is now projected to be 192,000 acre feet. Blue Mesa stores, the amount that they can actually release from Blue Mesa is 826,000 full. That's 23% of live capacity in the reservoir. Not very good. It's the lowest since the reservoir was filled in 1966. It will be the lowest since the reservoir was filled. It's dropping by about three tenths of a foot a day right now. And those releases are occurring. As you can see, they, they said 14,000 acre feet is gonna come out in August 18 in September and four in October. We're still hoping to get some more information on how they're, how they're calculating the amount that they're releasing for this particular purpose, but uh, we should be getting that soon. So the good news is that 90,000 acre feet of that 190 is likely going to be stored under the Taylor Park water rights under an exchange that is allowed. So Taylor Park can run their water down into the Aspinall unit and then it gets released from the Aspinall unit to the Gunnison Tunnel. So that water is water that the state of Colorado is, is saying that's not available for drought response operations. It's owned by the uh, Compagre Valley Water Users Association and it cannot be released, so therefore you're only left with 100,000 left of the Bureau's water rights that can be used for these compact compliance purposes. So impacts to the recreation are probably at least the biggest you're gonna see here coming up shortly. And the Lake Fork and Iola boat ramps, the Curricanti National Recreation Area announced that they will are anticipating closing those boat ramps on September 7th because of low elevations. The Elk Creek Marina uh, concession operations were probably going to close then anyway because of school going back in session. There's just less people visiting. But the boat ramp, they're going to be moving it to a lower elevation coming up in a few days. And then it will completely close, anticipated to completely close September 27th. Because they just won't, there won't be enough water in the reservoir for people to launch the boats. I guess the good news is that we're getting closer to winter at that point. 
And so ice fishing season will begin and the fish will be crowded into a small area. So if you like to ice fish, maybe you'll be, maybe you'll be lucky and catch some big lake trout this winter. I'm looking on the bright side here for the recreation. Uh, so now uh, finally at the end you get to see a picture. Um, unfortunately, it's not a really positive picture because this is a picture in 2018 that I took at the Lake City Bridge. The previous low for Blue Mesa sense filling was hit in 2018, 246,868 acre feet to be exact. That's 12 feet higher than we will be at the end of 2021, uh, according to their current projections. So you see the river, you know, basically, uh, there's a family that used to farm down here. This is Iola, the town of Iola was here. They used to farm this, and when the, when the Bureau built the reservoir, they compensated them by moving their farm up to a side tributary on Stove Creek. Um, and they went down here, he told me, that they went down here to see the foundations of the houses that uh, his parents grew up in. Um, they're gonna be able to see them again here shortly. The lake was way down here. The Elk Creek Marina is right around that corner. It's gonna drop and there will not be lake visible from the Lake City Bridge when we get to 192,000 acre feet. So the gist is pray for some snow this winter because that's really all we can uh, do to, to mitigate this is have a good snowpack year. You know, the, the good news is that the basin that's above Blue Mesa Reservoir, if we got a very good snowpack year like we had in 2011, it could probably fill actually, but the the, the bad news is that the forecast is for us to have a second La Nina year this year, which in on average statistically does not produce high amounts of snowpack for this basin. It has though on a couple of occasions produced some big snow years. So I'm keeping my fingers crossed that we hit another good La Nina year this year. The, the, the prediction is 70 to 80% chance of a mild to moderate La Nina event, which is, sorry, I should explain for those of you that don't pay attention to this like I do, but La Nina is <clears throat> part of the El Nino cycle. La Nina means that the Western, the Eastern Pacific is cooler than average. It tends to produce a jet stream north of us. And so you get a lot of snowpack in the Sierras, Northern Sierras, Oregon, Washington, and even Northern Colorado to a certain extent but you don't get much on the southern part of the state. The middle part of the state is a big crapshoot regardless of what year you have on in most cases. But whereas an El Nino year is the opposite, you usually get a lot of snowpack in the lower southern portions of the basin, which would be good for the Colorado River because most of the Colorado River basin sits within the southern portion of that area. So there's the Lake City Bridge. There's a lot of nice grass there. You can go you know, have a picnic, I guess. But uh, anyway, so that's all I have for you. Uh, so I'd like to leave time for questions. Hopefully I did leave time for questions. We have a little bit of time. Um, thank you so much, Jason. I think it's fascinating to hear about water. And you know, we hear politicians talk about water and definitely hearing an engineer talk about water gives us a different, um, different set of information and a lot more graphs. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Jason, that's a great presentation. It's a little bit dire, but uh, my takeaway from this is that uh, the occupation of the future is going to be a water layer. <laughs> your, your graphs uh, showed uh, a convergence of flow and usage. Um, we can't do anything about the flow, but the usage we can do something about. And the question I have is when, when they start looking at that, what takes priority, agriculture or population? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, the state constitution, I can speak to Colorado, I guess, in more than I can to the surrounding states. But, um, well, and I can speak to the political reality, I guess, as well. But for Colorado, there is a provision in the constitution that gives sanitary uses for in-house purposes like flushing your toilet and taking a shower and keeping yourself 
washing your dishes and that kind of stuff to uh, municipal use for those purposes, not for irrigating your lawn. And so there is a provision that allows municipalities to, they can condemn water, they have to pay a fair price just like in any other condemnation proceeding. It's happened in the past, the city of Grand Junction obtained their main water right off of the Grand Mesa through a condemnation proceeding 100 years ago, and the people there still are angry about it. But, uh, but so there is a provision that, that would prioritize sanitary uses above agriculture. Other than that, there really is not in state water law. If you are a municipality and you want to keep your system running, what you are, are getting these days is what's called an augmentation plan if you need additional supply. And that augmentation plan means that you are putting water back in from some other source, either storage that you've stored in a good year, and you put back in the river to replace those diversions that you're making either from a well or from a diversion out of the stream that's out of priority or would have been out of priority. Uh, as far as the basin as a whole and the east slope, west slope, um, we don't have, the state does not have a, hasn't done a rulemaking on how we would administer a compact call. So I don't know, I can't tell you how we would administer it. Right now I'd have to say it'd be strict prior appropriation system. So strict prior appropriation system, the, the Colorado Big Thompson project, the Moffat Tunnel project, those are Denver Water and Northern Colorado Water Conservancy District projects, those are all 1933 to 1950s water rights. They are junior to the compact. So the one thing I didn't mention about the compact is it protects pre-compact uses. So if there was a use occurring prior to the compact being signed in 1922 or ratified in 1929, the compact can't call that out. So we can't shut that off. They can't ask us to shut off a water right that was being used prior to that date. Notice that those big diversions to the front range are junior to that. Whether our agency sent a water commissioner to shut off the Alba B. Adams tunnel that feeds four million, you know, a population of 4.7 million on the front range, uh, I don't know. I can't, I can't tell you. That's why we need uh, there is a plan right now, uh, the state engineer, uh, who's my boss, Kevin Ryan, is starting a process for measurement rules, because if we're going to have to administer a compact someday, we are gonna need to have rules on measurement. The, the measuring in this basin in particular, not Gunnison, but the West Slope. On the East Slope, because it's been so over-appropriated and there's so many high-powered attorneys, and uh, it is a good profession to get into, there is continuous monitoring on most of the diversions. So you can go look at what the diversion at the Burlington Ditch is at most times. The West Slope has very little of that. We have water commissioners that go out every week to other week and look at the diversion and report it and uh, take a diversion record, but we don't have the same level of recording. There needs to be some consistent measurement rules in the Colorado Basin. That process is beginning, you might see an invitation to, to, to a meeting with the state engineer to talk about those rules coming up in the next couple of months. Um, if you do, I encourage you to go and hear what he has to say, but um, I think I might have over answered your question, but. <laughs> We're gonna do one more quick question. Uh, thank you for your talk. At the end of your, of your talk, you talked about Taylor Reservoir. Is that the ace in the hole for a Montrose water? Because that project was done in 1909, which is before the 1923 water compact uh, agreements? So uh, that's a good question. Um, Taylor Park Reservoir was actually built in the 30s, so 1939, and its water right is 1939. But the, the water right for the Gunnison Tunnel is, 19, is a earlier 1913 water right, and it predates the compact, so that water right that's diverted, the natural flow water right at the Gunnison Tunnel would not be eligible to be curtailed by a compact call. This basin in general is, if you're gonna live somewhere on the western slope and you wanna have a firm yield of water, you should live here. <laughs> because because uh, the Gunkapagri Valley Water Users Association is in the enviable position of having 
The senior water right at the Gunnison Tunnel for over a thousand CFS of water, having Taylor Park Reservoir that they can restore in the Aspinall unit, having this giant bucket of, well, usually giant bucket of water in the Aspinall unit. Then they also have Ridgeway Reservoir that they can supplement with from the Uncompahgre. Ridgeway fills, they didn't fill this year for the first time, I think maybe the second time in history, Ridgeway is a small reservoir, relatively, in a basin that produces a lot of water, and so it will usually fill. They'll usually get their full allotment out of Ridgeway. And so even in a year like this, where it started out very poor, the water users were able to start at over 80% delivery. That is not the case in, if you go to the Grand Mesa, I don't know how many of you travel to the Grand Mesa, the Cedar Edge area, those reservoirs started the year uh, they ended last year at a record low carryover of 8%. Wow. They started the year at 60%. Whoa. And they are now probably going to end even lower than they started this year or ended last year. And so those orchards and vineyards and high dollar crops there rely upon water that isn't there. Like, I mean, so they're they are in a much more dire situation in this valley. So I guess I, my positive for the is to tell you how lucky you are to live in the Incapacitor Valley where we have a good firm yield of water. So, If you're lucky enough to live in Montrose, you're lucky enough. Yeah. <laughs> Jason, I, thank you so much. And I'll turn it around.